Good evening, everybody. This is AKA Heather Joy. And I am streaming uh, both to the Lifeboat channel and my own channel, AKA Heather Joy, uh, this evening. And so I just want to welcome everybody and glad you're here. Ooh, okay, before I get started, let's run through the rules. <laughs> Number one, uh, um, on the lifeboat, we we don't discuss politics unless well it, it's it's all up to Tommy's discretion, but we we try to avoid that unless it there are there are certain political aspects that have a lot to do with drugs at the moment and yeah we'll talk about those at times but other than that no politics uh, the second one this is not a religious channel you might hear people say things like hey I will. I'll pray for you or, you know, I couldn't have gotten, I couldn't have found sobriety without my faith. You know, those things are fine. But if you ever say something like, you know, my God is better than your God, or, you know, these are the reasons why you're not getting into heaven. Those absolutely not. Okay. So, oh boy, the th third one, <laughs> um, Please refrain from any foul language, both in you know the live chat and the comment section. As Tommy always says, if you can't control your mouth, then you can't control your life. And you know I wholeheartedly agree with him on that one. And number four, there is absolutely no place on the lifeboat or my channel for trolls, for mean people. You know, um, a lot of people really enjoy the anonymity of of you know, of the internet, and they can be very cruel to people um, because yet they aren't being seen. But, you know, there's no place on either channel for, for that. You know, people come here for support and to learn things that are going to help them, you know, in their journey towards, you know, good mental health and towards sobriety. You know, um, there's just no place for that. This is a place where when people want to be open and honest about what they're going through and other people, you know, are sharing things, you know, in support, you know, people need to be protected in those cases. So, you know, just a warning, if, if you are going to be mean, you're going to be banned permanently from either channel. So, oh boy, guys, um, you know, I was going to talk tonight <laughs> about um, a dopamine detox and I was just going, I had everything ready. I was, um, you know, I'd made my notes and my book and everything. And then I found this article and I read it and I thought, okay, that's what I'll do in the morning for tomorrow morning's live stream. But something, something about this, there's something pushing me to do this now. And I feel like it's, this is an important one. Um, I don't, there must be somebody, you know, that's listening that, that needs this message or need, you know, because I, you know, I don't know why I feel so strongly about doing this tonight. Maybe I'm just going to lose my nerve. I don't know. Anyway, you guys are getting a very different one than what I had planned on earlier today. And because of that, I am terrified. I am going to be sharing some things tonight with you guys that I never intended to share with anyone but the journal that I had written it down in <laughs> but for some reason I feel very strongly that I need to, to tell you about that and there like I said there must be somebody listening that that needs to hear this and you know I made a deal with God a long time ago when I was probably 19 or 20 you know when when my journey started towards trying to find you know better mental health and it, I was in a hospital and I, I made a deal with, with God. And I, you know, I said, if you will help me get through this, you know, I will do what you ask of me to help other people get through this as well. And so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to tell you guys some things that tonight that I never, <laughs> never dreamt I would ever talk about. Um, but if this can help somebody else, then I'll do it, you know. So, but anyway, to get started, there's a couple, there's a couple of different things that I need to touch on before I get into the, to the meat of things. 
and it'll it'll all tie together. But um, oh, you know, it, it's the first thing I, I just wanted to address is you know I I don't have TikTok on any of uh, I have on my laptop or my phone or my tablet or anything because um, it yeah I don't know it's just it would be a waste of time for me. I'm afraid I would get a little bit too into something and you know I get caught up in it and I'd want to watch one video after the other you know there's that constant dopamine dump every time and I, I'm just I, I don't need that I've got too many other things to do but I do notice um, a lot of people on YouTube you know but will gather different things that they see on TikTok and put them together to make a video of it and they'll yeah, we'll talk about it. And one of the trends, I guess, on TikTok is there are a lot of young people that are faking mental illnesses and mental disorders. Uh, I guess because they get the attention, they get clout, you know, wh whatever. Uh, but it, it kind of disturbs me. Um, for one thing, because people that have some have serious mental illnesses and need to be taken seriously and need people to believe them and to, and to listen to them, you know, and, and to get the help they need, you know, this isn't doing, this is not a good thing, you know, because if, if people are coming on and faking things like a big one, I guess right now is um, they are faking that they have um, disassociative identity disorder, which is a, you know, a new term for multiple personality disorder. And it's, first of all, you know, it's a very rare, it's very rare disorder. And, you know, as I've, I've been in psych wards as a patient, and I've also been a psych ward nurse. And there, I've seen it just a few times, you know, actual true cases. And the people that are suffering from it do not want to talk about it at all. They want to hide. It has destroyed their lives. It's destroyed their families. You know, it's not something that you would be happy that you've been diagnosed with. You wouldn't, you wouldn't be telling the whole world about what you're experiencing, you know, which is one, you know, one of the reasons why I don't want to talk about the things I'm going to talk about tonight. But, you know, it really, it really bothers me. Um, it, it, I think it's going to end up doing a lot of damage. Um, it, it, but it, it blows my mind that all these young kids come on and um, they'll fake that they have, you know, multiple personalities or that they have Tourette's or, you know, um, that they're autistic and they're happy about it. And it's just, it, it's just so confusing to me. <laughs> But um, I've noticed, I've noticed that's a trend. And it, it does disturb me. Um, Anyway, um, moving on, that's just one of the things I wanted to touch on. But second one I want to talk about is years ago, I came across an article uh, from, I think it was Psychology Today or something. I have it somewhere in my files. But the article was about the damage that children incur when they grow up in a home where one you know if they have both parents in the house and one one spouse is being very cruel and abusive to the other spouse um it's very detrimental to the children that witness that but you know you know it, it's it's horrible i'm sure i you know to watch a father you know, beat up on a mother, you know, physically, you know, the physical abuse or, or vice versa. But what was really interesting about the article was that it said that he, um, witnessing uh, the mental and emotional abuse, you know, for, of one spouse to another, that, you know, watching that and hearing and seeing what that would do, you know, was more detrimental than witnessing physical abuse. And I, I remember the first time I read that, that article, I reread it and I reread it because I'm like, okay, this explained a lot to me because I had witnessed my mother uh, just ripping my father apart with her words. 
just the, the things that she would say to him and the way that she tore him down the way that you know just it was it was horrible and watch what it did to my dad over the years and i'll never forget you know he got he got so depressed and you know the longer the longer this went on you know the worse it got it used to just i would just lay in bed at night awake worrying about my dad um he was he was a truck driver so he was often gone from home and you know he'd want to just you know when he'd get to come home he'd want to come home and relax and be with his family and, and just enjoy himself and and my mother has has well at the time had some very serious mental illness of her own going on and that's was the reason she was acting that way in the first place and i to this day i don't think she can remember even doing it but you know i'll never forget the time that my dad was so depressed and they had had a horrible fight and my dad grabbed his gun and took off out the back door and, and i saw him and i followed him out there and I don't remember after that. I know I went after him, but I can only remember stepping out the back door. And that's all I remember anymore. But I know I stopped him, you know, from, from shooting himself. But that's how badly it, you know, stole it and taken on his his mental well-being. And it, it just, so, you know, when I read that article, <laughs> It made so much sense to why I hurt so bad inside. It made so much sense. But, you know, it, it really, it, I've seen that, um, you know, as, as being a psychiatric nurse, I, I've seen that with many, many patients who had experienced very similar things. And it did, it did the same thing to them as it did to me. It just rips you up inside just confuses you i apologize said so it's, it's so scary for me because <laughs> i know how emotional i get i'm gonna keep going guys <laughs> um the next thing that i want to touch on is i want to talk about psychosis for a minute um i've seen this at, i've seen this as a nurse and i've experienced it as a patient, both, you know, psychosis is, you know, basically when you aren't functioning in reality. And I know, I'm sure I have been psychotic a lot more than I can remember, but there are specific instances that I can remember. Uh, I can, you know, I, one of the problems I had in my thirties and forties was hallucinations. Uh, visual ones where I would you know see people or animals or or things that that weren't actually there you know that was that was a problem at times um sometimes I would become obsessed with an idea or a thought and and and, and those and those thoughts would become rather delusional and and nothing off the top of my head clicks as far as one example but I know it it that it happened a lot but the thing the the, the psychosis that I think I, I struggled with the most was auditory hallucinations where I would hear people speaking to me that weren't there. And it sounded, it, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't just a thought in my head, you know, or a voice inside my head. It was as if someone was sitting right here next to me speaking. It was that clear. And, uh, a lot of the, there were there were many times that I had command hallucinations where the voice that I was hearing would tell me to do something that would that would harm myself. And I have scars. I've got a scar on my arm right here from a knife. I stabbed I stabbed my arm. I have one on my stomach. I've stabbed myself in the stomach. I have I have one on my left thigh where I have stabbed my myself you know it it's it, they were it was very troubling but what was that was even i think what was what was more difficult about about it was that at first when i was telling 
my psychiatrist that I was I was hearing these voices and things that they didn't believe me because typically uh, when people experience a psychotic break, it usually comes between the ages of 17 and 25. And that's usually when people are going to be, be diagnosed with schizophrenia or um, affect, oh, good grief, affective. I apologize, it just slipped my mind. Um, but that's it's what my diagnosis has been for a long time. And I've had multiple diagnoses diagnoses I started out with being told I was just you know major depression and anxiety and then it went to uh, being bipolar and and then it went to a couple of other things but it, I think the, the the final one that I had was schizoaffective disorder that's what it's called where you struggle with your moods uh, some people with this diagnosis are kind of bipolar and they'll 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 fluctuate between mania and depression but then they have the hallucinations of some type at the same time and that was that's has been my diagnosis for the last uh, i don't know 20 years anyway but it um you know it was it was a very scary time because this didn't start to happen to me where i was having hallucinations of, of these sorts until i was in my 30s and so I was, I was told I was a malingerer, that I was making it up or that I was, you know, and it, I think it was when I, the first time that I actually um, stabbed myself that, that people went, oh, wait, you know, she's serious. This is serious. She's not, she's not faking this. She's, you know, it was, it, but it was very frustrating not being believed. And I think it, I'm sure it set back my progress and you know it definitely ruined the trust that I had between the psych nurse and and my psychiatrist at the time too and that's unfortunate where I live because at the moment I don't believe we have a psychiatrist in this area um it's, it's a problem trying to keep them in our area because we are a rural rural area but you know it can that can be a problem and I I was I was thinking about that today, and I wonder, you know, we I've spoken about this before, where if you, you know, if you are an addict, when you're in your active addiction, it, it stops all of your your development, your growth as as far as your your mental and emotional faculties go. And I and I wonder if my addiction set me back. And maybe that's why. I was experiencing these these psychotic breaks, you know, in my 30s and 40s. I I seriously wonder, and I I'm not sure who to reach out to to to. I want to run this by a professional and just see what they have to say about this because I I'm thinking that's had a lot to do with why I was experiencing the experiencing these issues, you know, so so much later than than most people, but. I don't know. Anyway, um, let's see. I I can remember another time. Just to give you another example, I this is nothing I'm proud of at all, guys. But I did spend six months in the state hospital here in Utah, and that was that was not an easy time. I look back at it now, and I'm. In a way, I'm grateful that I had that experience because I got to observe a lot of the other patients. And, you know, there's not a whole lot to do while you're there. You know, they'll have group therapies and different activities, you know, several days a week. But most of the time, if you're in the state hospital, you've got to find things to do. Uh, it it was you know so I spent a lot of time getting to know the other patients on the wing where I was, and I found it in a way a lot of it was fascinating talking to some of these other people that that were schizophrenic, um, especially they were very interesting people to talk to, and I remember one one gentleman in particular I watched and he he was schizophrenic and he he had been from the time I believe he was eighteen. 
but it was fascinating to watch him because when he was out in the group area, he was very quiet and he didn't, he didn't speak up much. But when he went into his bedroom and my, my room was across the hall from his and I would just listen to him and he would carry on, you know, whole conversations with two and three people all at the same time. And it was really fascinating just to, just to listen to the conversations. It definitely gave you something to do in those long days, but it was, it, it really was fascinating. And, and then I, you know, and it made me understand just how much people with mental illness really suffer, you know, what it does to them because of their families, you know, turning their backs on them and their friends turning their backs on them and things like that. I just, I saw an incredible amount of suffering while I was there, um, it, it was, but it was very fascinating. It really opened my mind to so many things that I had previously studied. It, um, I'll never forget the one time, it was right after, the last time I overdosed, this would have been, 2002 and it was bad and I was going into uh, serotonin syndrome which is a very dangerous dangerous thing to be in and I remember I they put me after they medically cleared me uh, they moved me from a medical floor to psych floor and this is actually at LDS hospital in Salt Lake City where I was at the time and I don't remember how many weeks I was there I don't have any memory of getting there and I don't remember about the first three weeks, but I remember all of a sudden coming to, and I was sitting on the psych ward. I had no idea where I was. I had no idea how, how, how I had, had come there. It was the most disorienting feeling ever. Just, Oh, wow. It was, it was awful. Um, just, you know, big chunks of your life just, just missing and it really helped me understand um, a lot of the other patients when I was at the state hospital because they were they were having these these things happen to them very frequently and it just it broke my heart because I knew what they were going through and I, I know how disorienting it is um, not fun <laughs> But, but again, now I look back at it all now and I'm kind of grateful because at least I, I have a better understanding of what other people go through. And because of that, I can talk to people on their level and they, they know I, I'm speaking the truth because, you know, because I can tell them what I've been through and they're going through the same things. It, it really helps you make connections with other people. And, and, you know, and over time you can encourage them to get the help they need, that kind of thing. So I really am grateful. But you guys, this, this life has not been easy. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, but, okay, that's, uh, I got one more thing I, I want to tell you guys about. And this is, this is a big part of, of today's live stream. I remember, I believe I was 22 at the time. And I was, I was on my, this was my second nursing job since I graduated from nursing school. And all of these things, you know, um, started coming back to me, just all these memories from my past, the things that had gone on in our house, things, you know, I'd seen happen to my dad and things that my mother had said and done to me. Um, just there were a lot of things that I had forgotten about or repressed that were coming back. And it, it was it was just a very difficult time. I was trying to work full time. I had two uh, very small children, and it was just it was a rough time. And I knew that I needed to, to get help for these things. And I was so incredibly angry uh, at my parents, uh, my mother, because personal illness, you know, her behavior, but also my father, because he had put up with it, you know, and I was just, I remember being so angry, and, you know, my father had passed away, and that just left my mother, and I wanted to confront someone, you know, I was so angry, yeah, and my mother was in no place to, to be on the receiving end of that, 
but you know, I, I didn't care. I, I wanted to confront her. I wanted some answers. I wanted to know why I wanted to know. I wanted to know how deeply it had affected me and what it had done to my life. You know, I was incredibly angry, <laughs> be the key word there. And I can't even remember anymore if I, if I called her on the phone or, or what, but, but I confronted her uh, and I told her how angry I was and all of the things that I could remember. And she had no, either, either she was lying to me about it, or she honestly didn't have any memory of those things. But it was, it was not <laughs> the response I was hoping for. And rather than, you know, than listening to me, I mean, and really listening to me, she just got defensive. And, uh, you know, of course, she was very angry. And, you know, and if you have no memory of doing something and you're accused of something, I'm sure that's very disconcerting. You know, she was very angry. And, but it didn't, you know, it didn't end there. It, she ended up calling all of my siblings and telling them everything that I had accused her of. And um, so I started getting all these phone calls from my siblings as well. And which was very confusing because I had very distinct memories of things that had gone on and things that had happened. And um, yeah, it, it was, it was hard to take, you know, it, it really, it, it made me really question my mind, you know, am I, am I totally crazy? You know, I know I, I knew I wasn't making it up. It wasn't something I just created in my head. I wasn't doing it for attention. You know, these were extremely painful memories. Extremely painful things that I was remembering. And, you know, I wanted, I just wanted so badly for my mother to understand what it had done to me. It didn't, you know, it just, it wasn't, it wasn't the experience that I was hoping for. And I made a big mistake right there, right there. You know, I had, I had, you know, by this time I, I was um, depending more and more upon, you know, prescription pain pills, prescription narcotics to deal with everything that I was going through. And, you know, for my siblings to say, oh, that didn't happen. Well, my mother to say I never did that. I never said that. It was so frustrating. And I did. I questioned, am I crazy? Questioned my sanity. But, you know, I, I couldn't deny the memories I held up here. And I, you know, I came to the conclusion that, you know, this is the response that I'm going to get and people aren't going to believe me and I'm not going to get anywhere by trying to process these things with my family that I was just not going to do it at all and that's when my addiction got very bad from that point on it got very bad it was a big mistake you know what I should have done was found a therapist that started you know working through these things you know and it it, it, it wrecked my relationship with my siblings and my mother how could it not but you know i i i i've learned a lot since since then but i just remember an incredibly difficult time and it was just so frustrating when you have very distinct memories of experiencing something you know and then being told it never happened very frustrating very they're damaging i was already in a rather brittle state as far as my mental health went it wasn't for the best you know <laughs> so really that, that is when my addiction after that i thought you know what fine if if this is the way it's going to be i'm just going to numb myself as much as i possibly can but i and i sure tried for a very long time Oh boy. <laughs> you said I was I was never never gonna speak of these things in front of other people, you know, and tell you 
you know, what it's like to to not be in touch with reality and to to, to be so confused and to have hallucinations and things. But this is why I seriously wonder if you know that addiction didn't just stop any further growth. And I was already stunted as far as my emotional development, you know, just because of the, the house I grew up in, the things that had happened, I was already stunted. You know, my emotional intelligence, the intelligence at that time was not good. I couldn't handle any type of stress or any kind of crisis. It was, you know, it was just a very difficult time. And so I really wonder if the, my addiction really just really, you know, slowed everything else down. And that's why I didn't start to have these, these psychotic symptoms pop up until much later, you know, where generally it's between seven, 17 and 25 when people will have their, their first psychotic break, things like that, you know, and of course you can have them after that too, you know, but, but the first one generally comes in, in, in that time. And that's what I have seen most of the time, you know, being a psych nurse, that's what I have seen. You know, so <clears throat> what happens, you know, what happens when you aren't validated? What does that do? You know, I, 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 I like I told you guys at the beginning, I came across this article today and, and it was addressing this very thing. And it was, it was the, there's, there are two, I believe they're both psychiatrists. I didn't have time to look up each of the people, but there's the, the gentleman that, that wrote the article that I, I that I read today, his name is Daniel Mackler, and either a therapist or a psychiatrist, I'm not sure which, but he was referring to a conversation that he had with another lady that is professional she is a psychiatrist and her name i believe is ann silver but they one of the things i guess they spend a great deal of time speaking of back and forth with one another is psychosis and she said something remarkable and i want to read you just a little portion of of what she said about this um but actually, I want to back up for a second and just say, first of all, you know, psychiatric care has come a long way, you know, um, in the 19th century, you know, in Victorian asylums. I, I want to sh just share with you. Oh, no, I just bumped that out. Let's see. I'm going to share with you a couple of the reasons why people used to be put in asylums. And um, I'll show you how far we have come, okay? Um, the very first one uh, listed is just great excitement. You know, who, who doesn't get excited about something at one time or another? But if you, you know, if you were extremely excited, that might be a reason to be put in an asylum, um, disobeying your husband or your parents, um, you know, and who hasn't done that? <laughs> You know, but yeah, that could be a reason why you would be put in an asylum if you tried to leave your husband. Yeah. And, you know, how young were, were, were you know, brides when they were in, you know, in the 1900s, especially the early, I'm sorry, 1900, the 1800s, you know, in the early 19th century, you know, how uh, women got married quite a bit younger, you know, when they weren't completely, de you know, developed they weren't done developing physically or mentally and emotionally. And, you know, um, dementia would be another reason you could be put in there. Melancholy um, is what they used to call it, depression. But being, you know, deeply depressed would be another one. Um, you know, having extreme anxiety, epilepsy would be another reason that you could be put in an asylum. Having Down syndrome, um, having a psychotic break, you know, having uh, having a breakdown could could put you in there. I mean, there's just there's some crazy reasons. If you ever visit what is it, the Trans Allegheny Lunatic Asylum in West Virginia, uh, my my baby sister uh, did a 
ghost tour and a ghost hunt a couple of years back at that place. And I guess it's a very remarkable building. Yeah. Has a lot of history, but um, she said she, she took a picture of the many reasons why people were put in that asylum. And, and it was just crazy, you know, just the, 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 the reasons why people could be locked up for the rest of their lives. You know, we've come a long way. Uh, but I was also thinking about the treatment of these, you know, different issues that people would have. Um, some of them were just absolutely barbaric and horrible, but, you know, one of the big ones was restraints of, of all kinds, whether you'd be, you know, placed in a chair and your ankles would be locked down and, and then your wrists on the, you know, on the arms of the chair and you'd be just tight there. Uh, they had these, these adult size crib type uh, restraints where they'd lay a person down and then they just put a cu is this cover down over them so they couldn't escape. I mean, that's another one. I mean, there were just any, any way you can think of being restrained. Um, it was, was done. I remember there was another treatment that they used to use um, where they would put people in a spinning chair and then just spin them you know they, they they and the doctors at the time were thinking that you know if you if everything is is already a mess up here and things are you know discombobulated may, perhaps spinning them around <laughs> would make things better uh, i know that they did a lot of um cold therapy where they would just spray people with hoses with really cold water or they put them in in cold water i mean you know ice ice baths and things like that just anything they could think of that would that would you know hopefully knock people out of of the psychosis they were in or you know what have you but, you know we we have come a long way and there's been a huge change in, in the way that 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 medicine treats um, psychiatric illness now. Um, and I, I am very grateful that I wasn't born <laughs> a few centuries earlier because I would definitely have been <laughs> locked up for my entire life. You know, there wouldn't have been any chance of getting better. I, you know, and it just, it breaks my heart. You know, people just, they rotted away in those places. It was horrible. You know, we have come a long way. Okay. But, let me jump back to that article that I was just telling you about that I read today. They were talking about um, what what is really behind when people have their first psychotic break, which again generally happens between seventeen and twenty five. And I want to read to you what um, what let's see what. The one psychiatrist said, uh, okay, this is what she told the, the, the guy that wrote the article. He said, she said, you know, I've been thinking a lot about the subject of, of psychosis. You know what I think it really is? I think it's just horrible things that little children went through when they were very, very young. Terrible things that they went through that they couldn't deal with and they buried and they split off. And I just want to remind you, you know, I've been following uh, Dr. Gabor Mate and and he is all of his research is showing how, you know, even as infants, infants can pick up on the stresses that the mother is going through and they will change their behavior because of it. But, you know, that anything traumatic, regardless of your age, something really traumatic will give structural changes in your brain and chemical changes. So to me, it makes sense, okay? Um, but continuing, I wanna read you the rest of, of this quote. That, um, she said, it's not really even a sickness or a disease at all. As psychiatry says, really what it is, is they are trying to reprocess. They're trying to make sense of what they went through they're trying to understand it, work through it. And so it's actually a very healthy process to make sense of it. And I totally agree with her. Now, what I added is that's not why, sorry, that's not all what the mental health field says. And 
what's also interesting, I said, is this. I've heard so many people say, yeah, but that's not what my son or daughter is going through when they had their psychotic episode at 17, 18, 19, 20, because they never had a traumatic experience like that. They never had profound abandonments or traumas. They never went through severe loneliness or anything like that. That's not something that my child went through. And Okay, yeah, that, that's all I wanted to read of that. But when I read that, I went, when I first read that day, I went, wow. I think they've hit on something. I, I, I have always felt that way about that too. And so it was incredibly validating to me to read that. And okay, I'm not the only one that that has been thinking that that is what causes psychotic breaks and psychosis. And in this article, it, it, is expl it, it explains how when people have a psychotic break like that to the rest of the world, you know, particularly to, to the people, around, the adults around that person that has a psychotic break and have found to you know, people that treat it, um, you can see that it doesn't seem to be based in reality at all. And a lot of times you will see something where they call it word salad, where people are just talking, but it's just the words don't, the words don't, are, are, they, they aren't, the words that are coming out of their mouth aren't, the words don't seem to be related to one another. Um, you know, it, but it, when you see somebody going through through this, and and I was just thinking too, I, I I another experience that I've had, and I remember when I realized that I was having a psychotic break. What was happening was there was I was I don't remember what was happening, but I remember how I reacted to it. I ended up getting dressed. My husband told me, "Okay, you need to get dressed. You need to get up, get cleaned up, get on with your day." It was a time when I was really, really struggling, and I remember getting dressed and presenting myself to him. And he he looked at me like, "What?" And I remember look. This is what I remember. I remember looking down. I had put my clothes on first. I put my jeans on and a shirt on and then I'd put my underwear on and my bra on on top of it and I remember looking down and thinking wait whoa why did why did I do that you know it, it just it happens you know and and I'm sure to my husband you know it didn't make any sense at all and honestly to me it didn't make any sense at all but I bet you if if I could remember what was going on and what, what it was I was dealing with at the time what I was trying to process that anything it had bet you sorry speaking too quickly bet you anything had something to do with something that went on when I was very very small bet you anything but you know it just when I read that article today I went wow you know people are getting it people are are starting to make sense of this thing but, you know, what, what is really sad is the way that these things are treated. Uh, you know, as being a psych nurse, um, one of the primary things we would do is medicate people. You know, people were, were psychotic and they were, they were talking absolute nonsense or they were, you know, incredibly, I think it's the word I want, but they're, you know, they're, they're acting, they're, they're, their behaviors and the things that they're doing with their bodies are, are, are just completely crazy to you. They don't seem to make sense at all. Just the, the crazy wild things that people can do when they're in that state, you know, it really doesn't make sense to you. And, and um, you know, psychiatrists, um, um, you know, will will try to medicate it. Uh, and I, as a psych nurse, I remember giving many shots of Haldol to people that were having a psychotic break. I remember, um, you know, begging patients, you know, you know, please, if you don't calm down, if you don't stop this behavior, whatever it was they were doing, we're gonna have to restrain you. And, you know, if somebody's in a, in a high psychotic state and, you know, and they're kind of in that flight or fight mode as well, 
these people can be incredibly strong, you know, because in their mind, something else is going on. And, you know, to be surrounded by a bunch of people who want to shame you is, is I'm sure, is terrifying. You know, I know what's happened to me, too. I don't remember. But I don't think like that had happened to me before I have been restrained. But um, I don't think that's quite the way of, of dealing with it. Um, because according to this article, if, if, if patients that are having a psychotic break are listened to, first of all, you know, if, if someone can sit down with them and just listen to them and listen to what they're going through, that is incredibly helpful. Um, and being allowed to just be there, be themselves, you know, in their mind, something that happened a very, very long time ago, possibly when they were still an infant, they're trying somehow to process all of that and come to terms with it and make sense of it so they can move on. You know, pumping someone full of chemicals is not going to help that. And, you know, it, in, a, in many instances, people do need to be restrained because they are going to hurt someone else or, the, or themselves. But, you know, if, oh, man, if you could just be allowed, if you're in that state, if you can be allowed to, to work through that instead of instead of it being all suppressed by a chemical, you know, how much better off are you going to be? And so I think in in many ways, when it comes to psychosis, I don't think that medicine is dealing with this quite right. And and I, I remember reading an article a long time ago about how other cultures uh, manage mental illness when when someone is going through that in their community. And there's one I don't remember what country in Africa it was, but um, it's definitely a third world country. And when people are, are experience, experiencing psychosis and they're not quite there in reality with everybody else, these people are actually respected, you know, and if they are having conversations with people that the rest that, you know, that the rest of the tribe cannot see, they actually they, they look at that as this person is actually very special they call that person a healer and they aren't restrained they aren't full of chemicals and they um they actually end up turning to that person for um all kinds of different he things that that require healing and i, and I love the way that they they, they, they just, they see mental illness as something completely different and they believe that those people are actually gifted. And I, and I in some ways I really like, I really like that in, in some ways. Um, but you know, this, this is a difficult thing. You know, if a person is psychotic and they are gonna hurt themselves or hurt someone, of course you've got to restrain them. But I remember being on some very heavy duty antipsychotics. I couldn't feel anything. I wasn't happy. I wasn't sad. I was just, I just existed. It, it's not fun. And you, it, you feel incredibly drugged, but not in a good way. And oh, I, I don't honestly don't think I had any benefit from any of the antipsychotics that I have ever been on. And I remember, you know, even after I had, was sober, I was still having multiple problems for a while and I remember in 2016 that was really the year I just woke up and be finally became myself but one of the things I did I had just something deep inside me that said you need to quit taking this and this and this and they were all some heavy duty antipsychotics and I was having to go in every week to have all of my meds filled for the week by a by a psych nurse and so, you know, they, and they, you know, they ask, they question you every time you went in there about your behaviors and your thinking, everything they're trying to see, you know, and, you know, if I had told them that, <laughs> that I wasn't taking my meds anymore, they would have freaked out and they, I would have been forced, you know, most, most likely I would have been um, admitted somewhere. And as long as I, you know, did not take my meds, they would have been, they would have given me shots, you know, and I would have been forced to take my medication. And that honestly didn't do me any good. I was, I wasn't making any progress as far as my 
my therapy and things because I couldn't feel, you know, if you can't feel your feelings, you can't process them. I don't know. It just, I find it, it I find antipsychotics incredibly damaging in many cases. And I'm not saying if any of you are on them to run out and just quit taking them. No, no, please don't misunderstand me. That's not what I'm saying. That's really something that you should, you should talk with your doctor about, honestly. But, um, you know, I remember reading that article early today and just going, wow, you know, because I always felt that, that, you know, chemical restraints aren't helpful. They don't get to the core issue. You know, so why am I talking about this? Why am I telling you guys some of the worst experiences I've had in my life? You know, why would I do that? It's because I want you guys to understand several things. Number one, you can you you can you can overcome anything. You know that I that I'm I'm sitting here in front of this camera today talking to you guys and and cherish these things with you is huge. That I can string tenances together is huge. You know I I was very different. You know just just even a decade ago, very different person. I didn't get much done. There was you know I life was I really was just existing. I didn't have quality of life. And I'm very grateful to be where I am now. But and the reason I'm sharing these things with you, is, first of all, like I said, I want you guys to understand that healing can happen and it doesn't matter what point in your life you are. You can, you can heal from the traumatic things you have been through. You know, and if you are one of the people on the life, but listening to me right now, you know, they're, they're, more, most likely there is something very deep, very traumatic that has happened to you that is behind your addiction that, you know, that caused you to want to escape from it in the first place. And I promise you, you, you can figure out what that is and you can get the treatment and the help that you need and you can overcome it. And it's incredibly green when, when you get to that point you know, when you figure out what it is that is disturbing you so deeply, you know, it, it's not fun and it's not easy. But if you want to be sober, you know, if you want to have a good life, to have a good quality of life, to have good relationships, you know, it's something that you need to do. And I promise you, um, you, you can do this. You could overcome anything that has happened to you, no matter how ugly or how bad it is. And when you do that, you become so much stronger. So much stronger. And life becomes so much better when you're not in pain all the time. And when you take care of that, that core issue, that urge and those cravings to take your drug of choice or, or whatever it is that, that you do to, to escape from that pain, you know, you, it, it can go away. It really can. And, you know, I just, I, I, I don't know who it is that needs to hear this. But I have been so bad off, guys. Imagine what it takes to be put in a state hospital. I was really bad off. I am 100% the other direction now. It's still a challenge. Things aren't always easy. Life is never perfect for anybody. But dang, my life is so much better. And it's rewarding now. And I love reaching out and trying to help other people. And I just really want you guys, whether it's on the live boat or my channel, I want you to understand it does not matter what you've been through. You can overcome it. And 
if you have been through something similar uh, to the experience that I had when I first tried to com confront my family about all the stuff that had gone on, you know, it was an absolute disaster. And it made me question my, my reality. And I'm sure I'm not the only one that has experienced that. I'm, I want you to not give up. Don't do what I did and, and turn to some to a behavior or a drug or alcohol to to numb yourself please don't do that i know it's incredibly scary facing things that you tried to push away for so long it's not easy but i promise you it can be done you guys can do this you can find that life is beautiful and it's wonderful and relationships can can be fantastic you know life can be worth living really fun you know, can can find sobriety too it is incredibly wonderful do this guys you you do the i do, you know and again i just repeat you know if you have had an experience where you were told you were crazy or that you were making it up or, you know, what have you. If you have been through something like that, please do not give up. You know, it, even if you find a, you know, like the experience I had where when I was dealing with so many hallucinations, especially the auditory ones, you know, and not being believed that it was actually going on. You know, if, if something like that happens to you, it, Find a different doctor. Find a different therapist. Don't give up. You can do this. Seriously, you can do this. And, you know, if I, I anybody has experienced anything like this or you have questions, what have you, please reach out to me. My, <clears throat> my uh, email is in the description box um goodness was that ever i hope that was everything that i wanted to cover today but i just want let me flip over here and just see who is in chat noise opera miss v cultivate kindness charles mcclellan john doe Zenwin, ghost of stacy popolina mr ray ray charlie mullins who else have we got here? Ladybug. Hey, Ladybug. Spanx Calhoun. <laughs> Dennis N. Scott Nay. Hey, let's see. Tommy Bird. Um, who else have we got here? Miss Dragon. Goodness. Scooby. <laughs> I just love it that you guys put up with me <laughs> that you guys will sit through through a show because i know i'm not tommy i'm not a public speaker at all <laughs> i'm just excited that you guys come and listen to me anyway thank you <laughs> i crazy cat let's see wharton is here who else if i miss anybody i apologize let's see dennis brace is here cindy party um Goodness. I hope I haven't missed anyone. That looks like, and Mark. Oh, and Mark is there too. All right. Well, like I said, if, if anyone has any questions or you want to talk about anything that I have talked about today, please reach out to me. I'd be more than happy to talk to you. Uh, tomorrow I will be, tomorrow morning I'll be talking about um, dopamine detox. I found a book that I've been reading and I want to share with you kind of a book report in a way, <laughs> share with you what I learned from it and maybe it will help some of you. But um, Let's see. Just looking to see if I missed anybody else. Todd G. Hey, that's a name I don't recognize. I am glad you're here. I'm so glad all of you are here, whether it's, whether it's the live boat or my own channel. I really am doing this 
because of that deal I made with God a long time ago, that if he helped me get through this, um, I would do the same. You know, I would try to help other people. Had no idea when I made that deal that this would take 30 years <laughs> and some really ugly times. <laughs> but I am who I am. And I am strong because of everything I've been through. And it's possible for all of you as well. I promise you. I hope you guys have a great night. I will see you guys in the morning. And I hope you have, like I said, I hope you have a great night. You know, reach out if you need help or, you know, just incredible thing about the lifeboat is just that we, we, share ourselves with one another we support each other and it's incredibly helpful you know when people believe you when they listen to you it does more good than you possibly imagine and i'm sure many of you if you have not been believed especially when it's something very important to you that's devastating and, you know that's let's try and avoid that <laughs> You know, um, just please reach out. Don't isolate yourself, especially if you're struggling. Uh, reach out, okay? I'll talk to you guys in the morning.